Hello, everyone. Welcome to this We Did It Dot Health event. At We Did It Dot Health, we're working to create a healthy, happy, vegan, and plant based world. We're doing that through building community and offer, offering resources such as today's discussion to help you create relationships where you plant seeds of hopeful curiosity in others when they ask about a vegan or plant based lifestyle. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also invite you to join our Facebook community so you can connect with others and find support and encouragement with like-minded members. My name is Mirakita Solis, and I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Lisa Kay, internationally known activist, to today's program. So everyone that's watching, please give us your questions for Dr. Lisa and your comments, because this is going to be a very powerful learning experience. So welcome, Dr. Lisa. Thank you. Happy to be here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So how long, tell me about, how did your journey start? Well, you know, Tom Reagan writes about how some people begin, different types of people, they have that, you know, Damascus moment where it's sudden or they're slow and plodding. And then there's those who were just kind of born into it. And I was kind of born into it. I think very early on, somebody looking on could have said, huh. That one's going to be a, that's going to be an activist and there's going to be a whole lot of subjects on the table. Um, but I will say that my sister was very important in directing me to animals and, and looking at, looking at non-human beings. Well, she was important to pretty much everything, feminism and earth, but my whole family was important to especially, and my mother as well for feminism. So I would say the influence of family and also just something in my own heart. Mm, that's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So you were a child of the earth. <laughs> Very much so. I love that. Well, so let's see. Well, I guess whenever you're ready, um, I'm you ready like to start. Okay. Let thanks, me get your, thanks to your help. I think I can make this happen. Let's see here. Click <laughs> all on right. all the right buttons. All right, here we go. Okay. Now where's that one? There it is. How's that right. look? Yeah, just so everybody knows, I can no longer see you, so I'm flying blind here, but I'm just going to go ahead and give this presentation and then get out of this so I can see you again. Sounds good. All right, so, huh, this does not appear to be the first slide, so let's back up one. Whoops, how'd that happen? Whoops, something has gone fishy. Hmm. We had this, right? Yeah, we did. But you know how that goes. We had this. All right. So give me, I'm sorry. Give me one minute That's while okay. I go clear to the top here. Click on this one. Then go into this and try again. All right. Now let's try this again. All right. So let's first try one slide here and make sure we got Yes, I'm pretty sure that's looking right. All right, so I want to just start by saying that, as, as I said, I came into this with a whole table full of concerns. But animals have roughly been, they have been more or less the center of my focus for most of my life, and especially as an academic. Although I have looked at the connections um, I've always looked at the connections, whether it's with feminism and women and the, the oppression of females or uh, environment and how the environment's treated or the many other interconnected forces that come with a sense of oppression. When you have a sense of oppression, um, you have a sense of oppression and it affects more than just one. So water systems is a topic, is a special focus that I'm gonna be on for this talk. And I'm choosing this because most people focus on the atmosphere. So I'm gonna focus on how what we eat affects um, the water systems, the water that we so desperately need to live. Note that I use the term animal, and that is because animal includes human beings. So when I'm talking specifically about every species except my own, I use the term animal. And if anybody, if any other species wants to sign or speak, they can use the same thing. So it's not exclusive. It's a term that anyone could use to talk about any other species except their own. These are the books that are most relevant to the talk that I'm gonna to give today. I have one on primates and one on bears. 
they're all of the books that I write are solidly vegan. And what they do is they take iconic species and talk about how our diet affects the environment and affects these iconic species. Eating Earth is the one I would recommend if you're interested in diet and environment. And it's the main, most of what I'm taking to talk about today comes from Eating Earth. Uh, animals and environment, similar, but much more expensive, whereas Eating Earth is just cheap. You can get it for a few bucks online. On the right is a new book, Amore, Vegan Ethics. And that one talks about the interconnected oppressions, one of which is the environment, and that's the E at the end of Amore. So the topics today are fishes, fishing, consumption, and pollution, and that's the order that I will that I will cover them. Let's begin with the fishes. Fishes live on earth and yet they live in a different world. And what that means is we can't see them. We can't feel them. We can't touch them. We don't know them. They haven't got fur. They don't have the big eyes. Well, they do, but they don't look at us the way a cat or dog does because they're under the water. You can't see them. So we're talking about something here that is more challenging to get people to care about. But the fishes matter. Who is this being? Who is this fish? Who, is, who are this fish's friends? What are their favorite foods? If they were going to look for a treat, what would they look for? Where do they like to sleep? How do they sleep? Do they close their eyes? Do their fins still move? This is an individual, a being. And fishes are intelligent, social, and sentient. They, they are people like we are people. And if you think about being one of these fishes, look at those fins. Imagine, I mean, I don't know if they have sensations in their fins, but imagine what that feels like to have the water flowing through your fins like this little fish has. They live in communities, as that one does, and as this one does. And despite all of these things that we know they can learn, they can remember things, we've, they can probably remember things a lot longer than a year, but tests have probably un, unkind tests have shown that they can remember things for at least a year. And yet all of these things being true about them, that they're social, they're interactive, they're intelligent, they can do mazes, they remember things, they use tools. Who cares about any of those things? They're individuals, they're beings, they're people. And yet they are not protected by welfare laws. Let's talk about fishing, the ways that these beings are killed. And the topics I want to cover here are that fishing is indiscriminate. The methods that we use create a lot of bykill. And I want to talk a little bit about aquaculture and sustainable fish, uh, the, which are often what people talk about by way of trying to find a way to avoid uh, going vegan, avoid stopping the eating of fishes. In this talk, I am not looking at indigenous fishing. I figure there's activists in these communities that will cover these subjects from a, from a standpoint that is inside, and that's very important. Here's who I'm talking to. Anyone out there with a computer that is plugged in, you are who I'm talking to, and all your friends, your family, your communities. I'm not gonna focus much on freshwater. But I want to be really clear that there's that fishing causes damage. I mean, already we've talked about the nature of fishes, the fact that they can uh, they can, they can and do suffer. They're social. They care about their lives, obviously. And when you catch them with a hook, that's got to be extremely painful, not to mention terrifying. Anyway, we're going to focus mostly on salt water. So let me go on to look at salt water. The reason I focus on salt water is what, what if we go to the store and buy something to eat that comes from the seas, it is the seas. From, from the water, it's usually the seas. It's the salt water seas. So when we catch a uh, fish, we do it by the ton. We don't usually talk about individuals. We talk about tons of fish, even though they are individuals. And the weight of the fishes we pull in every year is equivalent to the weight of all the human beings on the planet. That's a lot of little dead bodies. Looking at the methods of fishing 
when I talk about indiscriminate, what I mean is whatever they pull in, they pull it in, and there's no assessing what that's going to be. Even if you have just a single line and a single hook, you don't know what is going to grab that hook, whether it's a small being or a larger being. This means we're going to have bycatch, and bycatch can be endangered species. Bycatch can prevent recovery of endangered species. There's a link here with animal agriculture in that 90% of the bycatch is fed to farmed animals, so they're getting profits by selling what they bring in that is unintended catch. And it's called trash. They're called trash, uh, they're called trash animals. Hooks cover a lot of our oceans because the long lines are so long and extensive. And again, whoever comes along and grabs a hook, grabs a hook and they're stuck there. They're going to have the damage and they're going to have the death. I worked on a fishing boat for all of a week and I watched birds grab the hooks and get drugged down and drown. So know that it isn't just the fish that people buy in the stores that are dying, that we can't control what's dying on those hooks, and that this is part of the environmental problem of trying to maintain species and endangered species, because even if something, even if they say something is now endangered so that it can't be fished, it is still going to be caught on hooks, uh, as well as, as I say, birds and other wildlife. And this is an example of what you know a single fishing person can do with a single hook dropped in the water, whether it's fresh water or salt water. So nets are the other way that fishing happens. And uh, pulling in a net, obviously, again, you can't control what is either scooped into the net or swims into the net. And so this causes uh, indiscriminate killing of beings. And nets in particular, anything that gets entangled, um, for example, a whale probably won't grab a hook, but they will get in, entangled in these nets and drown. So bycatch is common, and it's an absolutely horrible phenomenon. Uh, these beings die because they can't escape the net that they've become entangled in. And many nets escape fishing boats, drift nets, for example, and they're called ghost nets. These are made of plastic. They never deteriorate. They float on the oceans, and they kill whatever gets entangled in them across their basically endless lifetime floating in the seas. Here's a drift net. Like the long lines, they cover absolutely tremendous amount of space in the oceans. Uh, and so again, it, you just try to, try to imagine being a form of sea life, trying to navigate the seas with literally millions of hooks, if you, if you consider the seas, and millions of miles of nets in any given year uh, across the waters where you live. Trawlers are the worst offenders, and there is a one in one to five ratio of what they scoop in versus what they scoop in that they intend to scoop in and what we consider edible versus what they scoop in that they really don't want. So that's not a very good ratio. But of course, the worst is uh, the shrimp industry. So if you've got someone who is recalcitrant and doesn't care about all the suffering, but says they care about the environment, uh, perhaps they could start by dropping shrimp because eating just one pound of shrimp, you will have 14 pounds of other sea life that will be killed. Some will say that aquaculture is the solution, but it is part of the problem. <clears throat> Some of the specific concerns that go with aquaculture are water pollution because you have uh, intensive, you have factory farming in the water. So there's chemicals involved, there's pollutants involved, and you'll, and you'll also get biological contamination because some of the fish will escape. And we've had not only biological contamination, but we've had species uh, re that were released in areas where they don't belong and they become a problem. Uh, predator control is a problem. So if you have an intense group of fish, obviously fishers, bears, eagles, 
beings who normally live on fish are going to congregate there. And the government has a program called predator control where they hire people and or you are permitted to kill even endangered species if they will threaten if they threaten your uh, industry. You have altered ecosystems because of uh, all of this activity. And of course, again, coming back to the fishes, it's cruel. They're being farmed intensely and in ways that none of us would want to be treated. The other thing I want to mention here is that there's often a net loss of fishes because any fish that is on a fish farm that is a carnivore, you have to feed them other fishes. Aquaculture is not the answer. With regard to labels being undependable, a study ha has shows, and this is in Eating Earth, if you want to read more about these two topics, but 90% of the substitutions included overfished and endangered species, all sold as sustainable. So you can't believe these labels. So if you think you're going to eat fish in a way that is sustainable, think again, you need to go vegan. The next topic is consumption. So the number one use of fresh water is irrigating the many crops that we feed to farmed animals. 90% of our reduction is caused by factory farming and raising animals for consumption. The 70-60 is an important percentage to know. Of all the crops that we grow in the United States, 70% of them are fed to farmed animals. In the EU, it's 60%. So you think of all the environmental damage that is done to grow these crops, to feed them to animals. So if we were to stop consuming animal products, we could return at least 60% of that 70%. We could, we could have, you know, it's just an environmentalist dream. We could return this land to wild to its wild state and stop producing anything because it's so much more efficient to eat the vegetables and to eat the other plants fruit, fruits and vegetables and grains directly not to mention the fact that uh, things like fiber is completely lost in the process we lose 90% uh, of the protein uh, all of the carbohydrates so cycling uh, grains and other plants through animals is on many levels a waste, but where, where the waters are concerned, it is particularly, um, I don't know what we're thinking. Maybe we're not thinking, but uh, we need to, when we become aware of problems like these, we need to bring change. This shows, and this is a chart from Eating Earth, this shows what we're doing with the water when we feed animals before uh, before we feed things to animals and then eat them ourselves. So we have to keep all these animals and there's, there's obviously many, uh, there's billions of them on the planet being raised so that we can eat them. So first they're drinking water. And if you look at the bottom of the, of the chart there, that's the water that they're consuming. And on the top is the water that is needed to create their food. So if you take the cow on the left, that dotted line on top, what the cow consumes in water as a species, what cows consume as a species annually is the same as the annual flow of the Amazon River. If you add up the cows and the pigs and the chickens and surprisingly the goats just as much, if you add them all up, you have practically four years of flow taken up by the drinking and eating of exploited animals exploited for food every year. And that's a big river. Not surprisingly, rivers are running dry. We are simply using up too much water in ways that are not efficient. The Colorado is an example. Uh, 70 miles are dry. Think about what this does to that ecosystem where water has always run, you know, back as far as we can imagine. Water has run down the Colorado. Now there's 70 miles where there's no water. What happened to the beings? How are they faring? The ones who depended on that for their source of water. And I, I worked for 20 years in Montana and very near the place where I lived, there was a ditch where they had diverted water from the Yellowstone River. Uh, and that was for feed crops, for growing hay and grains to feed farmed animals almost exclusively. 
And so I saw the quantity just in that one ditch of water that was being taken out of the Yellowstone River for that purpose. If, if, you're, if you know a vegetarian or if you are a vegetarian, know that you are participating in consuming the animal product that is the most environmentally damaging where consumption is concerned. These lactating cows need a lot of food and a lot of water because they're producing offspring that is then, of course, killed, but they still have to produce them, and then milk. So as, as when they're exploited as milk machines, they need to take on a lot of food and a lot of water. And if you think about what that could, what we could do with that food and water if we weren't consuming dairy, it's remarkable that one cow in one day can eat 56 pounds of grain and it could keep an adult alive on grains, eating grains and other things for a year. If you look at the diet in India, it could keep somebody happily fed for a year. So you think if we all, if we all refuse to eat dairy products, how far that could go towards solving a lot of the world's problems, not just environmental, but other concerns as well. The animal suffering, which is ex in, uh, you know extensive and intense in dairy, as well as making sure that the people of the world that we have don't feel the stress of food, which of course helps population. They're less likely to have so many children if they feel like the children that they have are going to survive. Here's some stats if you look at omnivores and vegans and the water use. And I need to add in there somewhere the vegetarians, but it's going to be far closer to the omnivores than it is the vegans because dairy is so intensive in water use. If you care about water use, you've got to stop eating animal products, all of them. The last topic is pollution. Remember that when I talk about the pollution, especially the poop that comes from these beings, it is raw sewage. It is not treated. So one pig produces four times the waste of a human being and it's not treated. It runs directly onto the land and directly into the water system. And one farm, Smithfield, 24 million tons of waste, raw waste that is not treated, that must go, that goes into the environment. It wouldn't have to, but it goes into the environment and um, has the effects, we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute, the effects of this. I had a friend at, when I was teaching in Montana and, and he just was cursing one day, he cursed out the cows and he said, those you know, cows. And I just looked at him and he was, this is a man who ate hamburgers and then cursed at the cows because he knew they were hurting the environment. How irrational is that? If you care about the environment, you have to stop consuming animal products. And note again here, when the in, where the intake is huge, the outtake is also much larger. So lactating cows are, again, if you're a vegetarian, you are choosing the source of food that creates uh, the worst environmental problems. Most people cover um, the GH, the greenhouse gas emissions and the effects on uh, climate change when they look at animal agriculture. And so I am, I am covering this uh, less in this talk, but I just want to say that this, that when you have all this poop coming from animals, uh, it affects the air and the water. Of course, eating animals affects, it, it is the largest cause of all the main environmental problems. But this particular slope for skiing back there that looks so wonderful actually has greenhouse gases coming off it because it is not a ski slope. You would need a hazmat suit. This is a pile of poop. Now, where does this poop go? We might wonder. Well, uh, it, it's going to end up in the water system. How much poop is it? Well, here again, we have a graph showing what each species produces. So if you look at the Hudson River, Cattle produce about as much poop, almost as much poop as annually runs down the Hudson River. And if you imagine, so let's say we have we have a little more than three years of poop from one year. So you'd have to, for one year of taking care of these farmed animals, you would have to have 
three years of poop flowing down the Hudson River to remove that poop out into the oceans from the planet. That's a lot of poop. So what do they do with it? They spread it on fields. They use it as fertilizer. This is the main way of trying to find something to do. And look at how thick that's being laid on there. They have more poop than they know what to do with. Poop hits the fields and it goes out. It creates um, it creates dead zones. So it'll, it, it, it makes the waters richer than they should be, which causes an algae bloom. And then the, they eat up the rich sources in the water and then they die. And when the algae bloom dies, it eats up the oxygen in the water. And when they eat up the oxygen in the water, the fish suffocate. They suffocate slowly and miserably because of the sludge from animal agriculture. So here you can see the effects of that running out into the waters from factory farming. These dead zones have been on the, I, I found one chart that went clear up to 2010, but it hasn't changed. It's just steep and it's getting steeper. So we have absolutely tremendous amount of increase in the dead zones. And as much as now 100,000 square miles of dead zones. And here you can see on the map, even the tiny little island of New Zealand, but of course it's an agricultural country, but they now have their very own dead zone. And it's not even a small dead zone off of their coast. Now, this is what it can look like. It looks like shining, glistening waters, but those are all dead fish. And the Gulf of Mexico is, of course, the main one that the United States creates and one of the biggest ones in the world, flowing through the agricultural lands and out into the ocean. But they are an international phenomenon. There's one in China. Here we have one in Chile and one in Florida. And as we look at that one in Florida, it's a close up enough picture that you can remember that what this man is walking in, these are individuals. These are sentient individuals who are, have intelligence, who have a social life, who died because of our choice to consume animal products. And what does it mean from an environmentalist point of view? What is in the water? Well, there's all the stuff from the slaughterhouses that get in there, the blood flat, fat, the hair, and the bits of bone. There's all the things in the urine and poop, especially the urine, though, that we feed to these animals, such as antibiotics and hormones. And this affects especially the amphibians in the water. But they've also seen fish that have uh, the wrong sex characteristics caused by these hormones. And they can find the effects of these types of pollutants, even in the most remote lakes now. They are all over the place. So, and of course, the herbicides and pesticides from growing the crops. And what we focused on is the poop and the urine. We may be able to survive the way we're polluting the waters, the destruction that we're doing. But what about this little citizen? and their family. Our oceans are in a state of silent collapse. They are endangered by how we are choosing to live. And like all of the world's greatest environmental problems, the biggest cause is what we are eating. It's the choice to be an omnivore or a vegetarian or for, for seas in particular, a pescatarian. We need to go vegan. Remember that our oceans are extremely important. They cover 70% of the surface. Their volume is 168 times that of land and 80% of all life lives in the ocean. The ocean holds half of the planet's oxygen, and absorbs five times as much carbon dioxide as do tropical forests. The waters are extremely important. But remember that, as I showed earlier, it's opaque. We can't see what's going on in the seas. It, things leak out, like now we're hearing about the floating plastic island that's out there, the gigantic waste 
So we, we are starting to learn about the problems. We know that we've been overfishing. We know that 90% of the predator, the large predator fish are gone. We know that 80 plus percent of the fisheries are dead. We know that we've gone from fishing what was easiest to fishing in the deep sea. And we know that by fishing in the deep sea, we're pulling out creatures that we know little about, that we can't study. The orange ruffy, for example, an absolutely incredible fish with a long lifespan that takes 20 years to mature. So 20 years, and I think they live, well, 100 or more years. They live a long time, but they take a long time to mature. And so when we fish them out, uh, you know, when we keep fishing them out, we affect them not only risking their their very existence on the planet, but also creating effects. Another one that we, we might look at is the uh, the bluefin tuna, one of the most incredible species that, that is out there. They are long distance swimmers. They're fast. They're warm blooded. They're iridescent blue. They're incredibly beautiful. They're huge. But right now, their flesh on the market in Japan, it's it's worth as much as silver, as the price of silver. And these big fish, because we pull out the biggest fish, there's a thing called juvenescence, so that when we pull out the fish, the biggest fish, then the biggest fish don't breed. So the species is actually shrinking. The, the bluefin tuna now are smaller than they were um, even just a decade or 20 years ago. And they're also, of course, becoming more and more difficult to find. The ocean looks beautiful, but these are all the problems that we face. And importantly, because of the problems that we're causing, sea animals are starving. So while we're choosing to keep fishing while the fish are becoming more and more depleted, those beings that depend on fish, the penguins, for example, are washing up in areas and they are clearly starving. They don't have a choice to eat vegetable stir fry. They need the fish to live. The percentage of salt in the water of the oceans is the same as the salt in our blood. We come from the oceans. And if we don't watch what we are eating, life is going to start dying in the same place that it arose. What can we do? We need to know this information. And once we know it, we need to change accordingly. Stop eating animals. And then we also need to speak out. We need to share this information. We need to help others to understand that eating animals is not sustainable. Go vegan and speak up. And, you know, you can do it for a lot of reasons. But what about this catfish? Can we care about her? Can we do it for her life? What about this telescope goldfish? What about her home? She doesn't have anywhere else to be. Can we change our diet for them? We need to rethink what we're eating because they matter, because they're individuals, because like us, they enjoy their lives and they don't want to suffer. We need to go vegan and we need to speak up for all the living beings and for the earth. And in the end, of course, it's for us too. We can't live without the earth and we can't live without other living beings. And frankly, I wouldn't want to. Thank you. That's all I have to say on the topic of water systems. And I want to remind you that if you are interested in this topic, the book on the far left is really cheap and has all this information and far more. And the one on the right will have not only information on the environment, but on intersecting oppressions. So thank you all again. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Let's see here. Let me take this off. Oh, now I'm well, not gonna, I don't want to get you out. I'm going to do this rather than risk. There we go. All right. Hi. <laughs> I think I'm in shock. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, this is great. I feel so sad, I, I, but it's very important that I know this because like I was saying earlier, 
to a bunch of people that when I went to a festival a few weeks ago and tried to talk to people, the, the people that were set up in the booths for the water systems and for the earth, and they don't want to hear it. They just, I try to approach it and they're like, oh, well, one comment was, oh, well, the human waste is bad, right? The human waste, I mean, we, that's a whole different story. There's, we have sewage systems for that, right? And we have, that's- Yes, we do. What would you we say also, to that person? I'd say we also need to work on our own population. We absolutely do. But there's nothing that individual can do about all the human waste. What they can do something about, if they're sincere in their concern for the environment, is change their diet. And if they're just going to point their fingers at things that they can't do anything about, they're probably not particularly sincere. And that's what exactly. I'd say to them. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the disinterest was just off the charts. So um, that's disappointing, but that's all right. Uh, at least I did plant a seed. Good so, for you. That's why we do what we do. Right. Let's look at some of these great comments that we've got going here. Um, JJ's watching from Vegan Knowledge. Um, and then Daniel, Daniel Robbins is here saying, yes, too much biological oxygen demand. That was for the fish right in the waters. Yeah. And um, Rebecca, you know, B BJ from Climate Healers. Oh. Say, she's wonderful. We're going to be working together. She knocked it oh, out of the good. park. Did, you did. That's for sure. You did knock it out of the park. Thank um, you. Let's see. Here's what BJ is saying. What does she think about the excuse that everything we do causes problems? Yes, that's what I heard. Everything we do. Okay, so I'm never going to be perfect. Should I become an axe murderer? It's the same argument. It's ridiculous to say that just because we can't solve all the world's problems, we shouldn't do anything. And that's exactly what I reply to that. You can do something and your choices in your life. We got here by the choices that we make in our life and we can change it in the choices that we make in our life. Exactly. So how much of the ocean now is dead zone? Sorry, my kitty's coming up no. to say hi. How Honey, sweet. can you please, can you please not get tangled in the things? Okay, <laughs> here, let's go right over there. Be a good boy. That's a good kid. I'm sorry. Now, what did you say? How much of the oceans is dead zone? Well, the hundred thousand square miles is what we are now at, and I have watched this. When I first started talking about this, I don't remember what it was, but small, small. The one in the Gulf of Mexico was, I don't know, maybe half the size it is now. And worldwide, there wasn't one in, or it was so tiny in many of these places, it wasn't noticed. Now there's one off the Oregon coast that wasn't on the map when I first started looking at this. So the increase in our consumption, you know, and this is where it's frustrating when people would say, whatever you eat is going to cause problems. You show me any problem equivalent to dead zones that comes from eating a vegan diet. There is none that's equivalent. So it, the idea that somehow you can conflate it so that because there's so many problems, I'm not going to do anything. Again, it comes back to just saying, well, I'm going to make things as bad as I possibly can because whatever I do won't be perfect. What kind of an argument is that? But let's, yeah, it's a terrible argument, right? It's no argument. Insincere. It represents insincerity. I say to people, you have a choice between if you are informed, if you know what's going on in the world, and if you are sincere in your concern for the environment, then you have to go vegan. Now, if you're ignorant, you can keep, an environmentalist, you can keep eating whatever you want. And if you don't really care about the environment, but you're just pretending, then you can also go on eating whatever you want. But if you're informed and if you're sincere, you have to go vegan. So what about your colleagues, the ones that are not vegan, that are environmentalists? A lot of them are old timers. And I will say that the younger generation is getting their act together. And, and that's kind of, you know, you need to hand the torch over and be glad that the younger generation is, is at least looking. I mean, there's more young vegans now that, I mean, when I was a kid, there were no vegans and, you know, there's no vegan food. So we're seeing tremendous change. And a lot of that uh, is people recognizing that their lives, they're young and their lives are endangered by the choices that my generation has made. And they're determined to try to do whatever they can because they also want it like the fishes. They want to have a life. They, you know, some of them want to maybe uh, adopt kids or 
you know, create some family of some sort. They want to have their cats and dogs and, and enjoy their lives. And, you know, you, you can't do that when you've wrecked the planet. You can't do that when you, when the, when the climate change is so severe that you're dealing with the kind of problems that we're dealing with now, and it's only going to get worse. How long do we have? Wow. Um, you know, it's a great question. I'd say we don't have any time, right? What do you mean? When I ask that question, I guess what people tend to be asking with that question is, what about me? How long do I have? For those fishes, it's over. They died in the dead zones that we created. So the focus needs to be not on what we have, but on taking responsibility for the problems that we're causing and making sure that those that, that we do, do what is right, that we stop creating those problems. Exactly, you're right. And, and take the, I mean, these are, this is not something that we have to have. We don't have to be eating meat and it's hurting us in so many ways. I mean, let, in every way. Let me just say again, our diet is the number one cause of deforestation. It's the number one cause of soil degradation. It's the number one cause of climate change. It's the number one cause of fresh water reduction. It's the number one cause of water pollution. Our diet. So again, if anyone says to you, well, everything we do is, is you know, causing problems. No, your diet. If you're eating dairy, eggs, or flesh, your diet is the number one cause of all of the world's most pressing environmental problems. Wow, I love that. That That's very, very, yes. And it, it, the people, the humans are suffering. I mean, we're talking about social injustice in, in all areas. We're hurting ourselves. And, and, and that's just... what a, that's what Amore stands for. So Amore in that in the book on vegan ethics, Amore is the animal suffering. M is the medical problems that we cause ourselves and our families by eating animals. O is the oppressions. And that's that's where all of the human oppression, the world hunger that we create by consuming more resources than we should, the oppression of people working in slaughterhouses when instead they could be working out in the fields, which is a much healthier, I mean, but the oppression, for example, slaughterhouses. Amy Fitzgerald has done wonderful studies uh, with her colleagues showing that violence goes up in communities where there's slaughterhouses, that it's unnatural for people to kill all day, especially in those kind of conditions. So oppressions. R is religion, and that's one that the movement has largely ignored that we need to get on board with, that there is no religion that teaches that it is okay to cause the suffering and death that we're causing for no good reason when there's, pl there's plenty of other things that we can eat. And the final one, what's the final one? E. Eating. Envi envi environment. Environment. <laughs> environment. They're all eating. But yeah, the final one's environment. So Amore, so it covers all those reasons. And again, that book is new and it's it's the one that's supporting the work that I'm doing, but they're cheap. I think they're about 10 bucks to buy buy one. Get them, get them for Christmas, send them to your to your family and friends. It's an art, it is how people will understand that it isn't just about animal suffering, that there's reasons why everyone needs to think about going vegan. And by the way, um, uh, animals, animalsandreligion.org is where you can go to learn more about religions. I only have Judaism up yet. I'm kind of in the fundraising st stage and just tapestry is just getting going. Tapestry.org. Uh, Tapestryofpeace.org uh, is, I think, how you find that one to find some of the other work that I do um, or just under my name, lisakemmer.com. Wow. Well, I I'm working with my church also to bring this to light. Um, on the Earth Care Board now, and leader, I'm the leader of the animal animal ministry, which I'm really working oh to, God. right? Fact. Not just pets, but all animals, and healthy living group. We've got a great speaker tomorrow coming um, to talk, and um, so yeah, I'm trying to bring this together. So that that's what it's you're real. saying, right? Getting out into our community, into these religious organizations. And um, I know BJ, BJ is doing that too. And here's what she's saying. There's some churches that have fish fries, which makes no sense. It's the large groups that can help make a difference, right? Yes. And you know, you all that are working in this field, uh, again, a, a new book, if you go to my lisacamera.com and go to publications, there's a new book there. It's called uh, Animals and Christianity. It has everything you need to know to talk to other Christians about their diet. 
Um, and if you need me to send you a copy, I can do that as well. They're not too expensive, but still. And it's on your website. LisaKemmer.com under publications. Okay, great. What was the name of it again? Animals and Christianity? Animals, yes, and I'm working on all the religions. I've got I've got animals and Judaism written, animals and Christianity written, and I'm going to go straight through and have one for every religious tradition. But, you know, it'll take me a decade probably to get them all done and up on the website. And that's the hope of the website. I want that information to be absolutely free and accessible to the public. But, you know, that has costs and things. So it's a little, I'm waiting to put Christianity up, but I have to cover the costs first. Well, wonderful. We, we should all definitely go check it out. And here's what BJ is saying again. The slave labor in some fishing industries. Yes, in the, chi the, the, child, the child labor. labor. <clears throat> yeah, not mm -hmm. just in the fishing industries, but you're right. When we're talking about the waters, knowing that, knowing that, that like other forms of animal agriculture, the oppression and cruelty. Okay, so I worked on the slime line. I know what that's like. Uh, that's the processing of dead fish. Uh, uh, and, and I can tell you that those jobs are low paid. Um, it's like slaughterhouse work that you don't have any power. You work long hours and you almost always have physical damage done. So using that knife, you'll get carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, is a common one that you get from that, from wringing necks in chicken houses and from uh, processing fish. So again, how much healthier is it? And I worked in the fields when I was a kid, roguing spinach and picking cucumbers. And, and that work is good. That work was comparatively healthier and more pleasant. So that what we choose to eat decides where people find jobs. And none of us grow up with the idea that we want to work in a slaughterhouse. So when we, but when we, when we eat those foods, we are deciding that someone is going to have to work in a slaughterhouse. And it's always the most disadvantaged, those who are the most powerless, those who are often don't speak the language of the country they're in. They have no rights and no protections. Uh, slaughterhouse work, it, it, the best book on that that I have found is Gail Eisnitz. And it's, it's an older book now, it's from the 80s. That was before they closed their doors. And she really did an excellent study of what was going on in slaughterhouses. And she hadn't intended to focus on the human suffering at all. But the entire last chapter is on that just because it was so in her face how the people were treated, the suffering that they went through and the misery of the job that they had and how it affected them. Gosh, well, we'll have to definitely check that out. I remember reading in Fast Food Nation, and that was, I don't know, 20 something years ago or maybe longer about the, the workers, how, you know, they get hurt and that's it. They yeah. just throw them out, you know, no, yep. no rights, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. It really is terrible. So again, anybody who's trying to argue, well, everything has its problems, um, you know, they just have to decide for themselves. Would they rather be in a slaughterhouse or would they rather work in a field or processing peas? Would they rather process blood and bodies or peas and beans? Exactly. Right. And here's Dulce. Um, it creates more violent society, uh, just like um, Dr. Lisa was saying more domestic violence too. That slaughterhouse work. Yeah, it's it's just incredible. How can people be in peace if they're I mean if they're living every second of the day in in violence, just like the animals? My gosh, it, how could we live in a world like this? How could this yeah. ever be okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we've got BJ saying thank you so much. I send you love and gratitude. Thank you, and same to you. Let's see, we got another comment here from Dave. This will hopefully be so eye-opening to those who don't know what is going on with our seas. I'm seeing the destruction of our seas firsthand here in Florida. Yes, that's right. Yep, I see it where I live as well. I see things washed up on the beach when I go out there and I am just, I always wonder what could I have done? And you know, unlike the people who want to say whatever I eat causes problems, I have the sense, what could I have done? What did I do? I know it's a human cause. So what have I not done? What can I do more of? How can I prevent that sea lion, that seal, that fish uh, from washing up on the beach? And we are responsible. We have to take responsibility. It is sad to see it happening. So David, go out and you know help people to know what it is that we're doing and how what we can do differently. And don't get frustrated and don't lose hope. It is. It takes time to bring change. Yes, and Dave's a great ambassador, and um, I love what you're saying that 
we're the ones that cause it, right? And once we know that, that we are contributing or, you know, we're, we're helping the cause with every decision we make, just like every food choice, right? Everything we put in our mouth is helping our body and helping the earth or it's yeah. not. Yes. So we have to be cognizant. It's mindful living instead of this autopilot. So somehow get off of autopilot, right? Yes. So yes. Absolutely. Yes. That's right. To look, look within. Right. Definitely. And um, well, this is, there's so much to discuss here. Um, what would you say has been the most powerful um, tool when you're talking to people? What, you know, what, what, what do they care most about that we might use? Themselves. Themselves. And so to me, this, you know, if, if they're a person who has children or grandchildren, that's the thing that they are condemning their children and grandchildren to a planet that is looking like it's going to be unlivable. You know, if they don't care about the fishes and they probably don't, but, but it's, you know, I don't hold that against them. They don't, they don't understand. They don't know. They've never thought about it. Our, our society goes out of the way to make sure that we don't think about anything that's going to interrupt capitalism the profits of those making profits off of the exploitation of animals. So it, how can you know this stuff unless you go out of your way to learn it? The people that are here listening, you know, this isn't something that they, you know, they didn't hear about this a anywhere locally or, you know, you have to go out of your way to connect with the vegan movement and to start understanding what connects the dots of oppression. So people are ignorant. And so the, the trick is to try to bring the education. And that's why I say I'm available. If you need me, I'm here. Uh, that's what I do. If, if I'm not sharing what I know, then, then I'm wasting my privilege. I've had the privilege of getting an education and being an academic and learning all these things and writing books and devoting myself to bringing change. And, and, and that is what my life is about. And that is what I am going to, that is what I'm trying to do. Changing my own life comes first, but then education knowledge, uh, change your life, educate others. So that's what we can do. Exactly. That's beautiful. And so here's still see again saying we need to foster agency and in individuals to help people realize they can make a difference in their day to day food choices. You're right. It's very this this idea of I'm only one person. I can't make a difference. Yeah. What would you say to that? I, you know, I challenge them back. Seriously, you've never done anything kind to anyone because you felt like it was hopeless you know, they're just blowing smoke. They don't want to change what they're eating. And, you know, so throw that back at them. Seriously, you have never done anything to try to help anyone or to make their life the least bit better because you knew it was hopeless. Usually they'll just be quiet at that point because they know it's not true. Right. <laughs> so, so what about your family? Are they all, I mean, are they really, are they really doing the same thing you are? Uh, no, I'm the activist in the family. Um, but, but you know, it, it's like anyone else's family. And you know, this is one thing I will say, don't, don't ruin your family relations, trying to bring change. Your family is stuck with you and you are stuck with them. They are your family. Be fair to them. Treat them as you would anybody else who passes you on the street. Don't hammer them. And I, I went through this very early on many, many years ago with my family and, and I'm, you know, they bear the brunt, especially when teenagers change their diet. I think back now on my mom who cooked for me for years and had recipes that were my favorites. And all of a sudden I wouldn't eat them. That had to be hurtful. That had to be painful. So we have to, again, that empathy, we have to extend it. Not just to, we need people to extend it to animals. And those of us who are animal liberationists need to extend it also to people. We need to think about who we're hurting when we are activists. And I, I say be in people's faces and it's a good thing. And don't be af afraid to tell your family and mention to your family, let them know you're vegan, let them know why. But don't make them miserable. Don't hammer them because they share a house with you. Keep your activism uh, to some extent out of your home life. Just again, take a stand. Don't be afraid to take a stand and let them know where you stand and let them know the information that you know. But they're stuck with you. They can't escape you. So activism is, uh, you know, it's reaching out, out to the larger world. No, I agree with that. And this is, that's very important at WeDidIt.Health that we really speak in effective ways and that, that we're not pushing people away. And our family, I mean, 
there's a lot of a big dynamic there, right? So we want to be gentle. And I mean, I'm just, Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, let someone else do it. I mean, tell why, but then let someone else be the activist for your family, right? Let them learn. It's too much. I mean, you know, from us, I I mean, we all are, I feel like we all are like, come on, hear me. We want that from our families. Yes, that's right. That's right. You're not making things easier, sir. (laughs) <laughs> He's like, but I'm part of the family. I'm part of the family. <laughs> Here, I have needs. Give me, give me, give me, honey. Can you please stay there? Yeah. So, yeah, this is very powerful. And so everyone, please hit subscribe. Also, while you're watching, it, it's really important to take care of ourselves first so we can be good advocates for our planet. And, and that is also true. Oh, Thank you for saying that. While I'm saying that you should not hammer your families, please don't hammer yourself either. Do not spend a lot of time. If you are vegan, you don't need to watch videos that cause suffering. If you you need to read some of the things to know what changes are and what's going on, protect yourself as a very long-term activist. I can tell you that it is accumulative. It is damaging. Protect yourself. You don't need to see all that suffering. You're going to see it. uh, you, You can't help seeing it if you're sensitive. And if you're informed, but you don't need to make it any worse than it is. You're right. And that's very important because I know a lot of, because because I also am a coach. So I work with vegans that are hurt and traumatized and then they can't get up and be active. And they feel like the animals are suffering so much. So I have to watch the videos, but that's not helping anyone. We have to take care of ourselves. That is wrongheaded. That right. you're absolutely right. That is wrongheaded. You, just because the animals are suffering doesn't mean you need to suffer twice as much. I mean, really, what good does that do? You're not helping them by watching their suffering or by immersing yourself in that suffering. In fact, you're hurting them because you are going to be a less effective activist if you become wounded or damaged, and you will if you keep that up. And, uh, you know, I hear about this. I hear about activists who had to quit, who had to take time off, who had to go into counseling. Um, and Patrice Jones wrote a book, uh, Aftershock, that talks about some of the effects of um, be immersing ourselves in this movement. It is very real. We, we can damage ourselves so that we are unable to be as effective as activists by taking on too much suffering. For me, I figured out what I could do. I could learn and I could teach. And I don't spend any time looking at the suffering directly. It is not necessary to what I do. And it it is not helpful to me. After all these years, it's the last thing I need is to see any more suffering. And I'm sure that's true. And if I could protect younger people in particular coming into the movement who don't understand that, please protect yourselves. Don't, Don't watch any more suffering than you need to to understand what's going on. And you can usually get that by reading and it's less graphic. Exactly. I know. I have a, a, another Facebook group, too, that where I have to just say no, no graphic descriptions, none of nothing. It has to be a safe place. I mean, there's a place for that, right, for for petitions and everything. But but there's too many people that are traumatized. So we've got to have some safe spots and we have to mm-hmm. have community. It's very important that we get out there and have friends and social networks, because when we're feeling sad, it, we've got to have people to reach out to. Yes, that's right. Yeah, vegan communities, that's another thing that's extremely important. Have some vegan friends. Have some people that you connect with. Another critical tool. You know, it's hard because vegans can be prickly. You know, we're particular and we're different. But uh, and so but but what's the best thing, of course, is to find a friend as as I've done. I have a wonderful friend here named Joe and she wasn't vegan and she is now. And I didn't say much. She just kind of watched and went along. And next thing I knew, she was, you know, she'd gotten rid of this and that. And then she was vegan. So uh, that's the best thing to do is just find somebody who matches your heart. And if they match your heart, they're probably going to end up vegan along with you. That's true. And I love how you were the example. You don't have to say anything. Just be. Be that light. That's right. Especially if you're finding somebody that matches your heart, you know, they're going to have that sensitivity. They're going to feel the same way you do about living beings and life in general. She certainly does. And she loves being, she's the happiest vegan. She's wonderful. (laughs) That's beautiful. I love that. Well, Dr. Lisa, I see we're coming up, uh, I'm running out of time here. So let's, let's have your final thoughts and where everyone again can reach you. Go to lisakemmer.com. You can find my email there. You can always connect with me. I'm happy to help anyone in any way that I can. Um, 
I would say thank you so much for being here, for getting educated, for being aware of the problems and for helping others to become aware of the problems and not despairing, but hanging in there and trying to bring the change that we need. So again, thank you. You can track me down at lisakemmer.com and publications is where you'll find those books. Again, thank you so much. And thank you to you. Thank you so thank much. You. Hold on one. Let me get one more question up here. I sure, see one sure, that's very sure. important. By BJ, is there one documentary you would recommend for ministers? Oh, you know, I don't, uh, they're working on some religion documentaries right now. Oh, there was, okay. Send me an email, please. There is one that has come out that I know of. Uh, and I know they're also working on some others. I guess what I would recommend, send, send me an email and I'll put you in touch with someone who I think can help you with that. The person I would recommend you get in touch with just off, off the cuff is Carol Saunders. And she has a spirituality forum once a year. What a great place to go and connect and heal and look for solutions. I love Reverend Carol. So that's beautiful. That's Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, this has been wonderful, Lisa. Um, you've been I mean, my mind is blown. So I'm going to go back thank and you. watch this. And thank you so much. Yes. And um, and then, yeah, we might have a Q&A later on. We'll talk about that if, if everyone, That's you know. Wonderful. So, all right, everybody. Well, Namaste Vegan. And I'm sending love to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lisa, again. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Happy vegans. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.